the book of Enoch, everything the Lord established in the New Testament, right? You can always tell when people or historical figures are phony or not. When you have phony doctrines, they try to force you to believe in a specific way. That's what they do, right? If you have doctrines that are aligned with the Holy Scriptures, because we're told not to not to even entertain any other doctrine, but that that Jesus gave, that of the uh, uh, Scriptures that Jesus specifically gave, not necessarily any of the Old Testament books or any of those things. We're talking about doctrine, right? Doctrine. This is how you live your life. We are supposed to have the doctrine of Christ Jesus. Jesus demonstrated to us how to live our lives in holiness. We're not to a, a live by doctrine, any other doctrine, but the doctrine Jesus established, right? All these other books, you can tell when something is real phony because they have you change, alter that doctrine. Jesus will say, forgive. These other things will say, don't do it, right? They'll say, well, somebody has to pay for something. It, it is very simple to see a false doctrine. Satan does not like forgiveness. He doesn't. Anything he ever printed, anything he ever encouraged, does not include forgiveness. So he does not like forgiveness. In your homes, right, you want to get some evil spirits out of your home, start forgiving everybody. Demons do not operate well in an atmosphere full of forgiveness. Demons maximize in an atmosphere full of accusation. If you accuse anyone, you have a door open to demonic activity in your life, period. You're going to have emotional swings and everything else. One of the telltale signs that evil has left your home is you are no longer moody, ever. That's a fact. No mood swings. Nothing is there to alter or augment negative emotions so when your when your emotions are positive you don't have mood swings you're not in a bad mood you do that by cultivating a very forgiving atmosphere the second is love itself love people through everything that they are don't look at a person and say well you know i wouldn't love this person except for or i could i could really get along with this person but through all that away love the person that you see before you right Never try to change them mentally. Never say the person will be okay only if they had this taken away or that. Nope, love them for who they are right now. That's very hard to do in this in this world. It is so difficult for people to do. It is, truth be told, it's very difficult. But that's something that you fight to do, right? Men, that's something that you utilize your strength to do. It's easy to strike out at anybody. It's not so easy to love people through what you see before them, right? It's not easy to love a person who is not really worthy of being loved by anybody who is hateful, mean, bitter, right? Divisive. It's not easy to love a person like that. It takes strength to love a person through all their abuses, all everything else that takes strength to love a person through that. Men, you're the example of that. You are. Not the woman, you are. You love people through what's presented because see, you're trying to reach people. You're here for the enhancement of somebody else's life in righteousness. To enhance righteousness, you have to reach the person first. You have to love them through everything. They're not going to be perfect. They're not going to conform to everything you want. You have to love them through all those things. How simple is that, but how difficult is that for people to do? And then they have to deal with these negative influences in their lives, in their minds, in their bodies. You boot those things out of your life by loving a person through everything they could ever throw at you. Love them through every accusation they have against you, all things. If they're looking at you funny, don't worry about it. Love them through that. You have that, you have such beautiful capacities. To do the unbelievable. But who's going to utilize it? The Lord gave us that strength, men. We're able to withstand everything. If we stand in love itself and do all things with charity. Hmm? We're able to do that. 
And I know it's a plague in the church. I know it is. You know what? Something There's something funny each week, right? Each week. And, and uh, every two weeks, actually, when I start going over, you know, little things or COT, little financial things, based on what I say determines the amount of dollar amount of donations. Isn't that funny? Now, this, no kidding. If I'm talking in line and I happen to match my talks match up with what everybody else is saying, smooth sailing. As soon as I introduce the principles of Christ, it drops to zero every single time. Like right now, I'm talking about love, right? Every time I start speaking about love and forgiveness, it's almost like people recoil. They don't want to do that. It's almost like people want somebody out there to accuse somebody with them, to blame somebody, and then they recoil. It happens every single time, every single time. And, and part of that is because when you start talking about forgiveness, you're not accusing. In order to accuse someone, you can't talk about forgiveness too. In or, when you talk about what a person, does, they deserve death or something like that, right? People, they kind of like that because it justifies their accu the accusation within them. You start talking about love and forgiveness, right? There's no place for that in righteousness. People recoil. They don't want that. They want revenge. So every time I have these subjects about love and forgiveness and things like that, it's, it's almost like the great mass majority. They do not like that. They don't like it. It's so funny how things work in it. It's consistent. It's been consistent that way for years. So I talk about love more and more. That's how I work. And that's hilarious, isn't it? No, that's not for everybody. That's just that's just how it works. That's just how it works. That happens all the time. Anyway, so the reason I'm talking about doctrine is because a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, Enoch, that's a doctrine that no, Enoch is not a doctrine. You're going to hear that this morning. It's not a doctrine. And it complements what Jesus already established, what the Father established through the prophets. And Christ, for example, we're going to read 94. In 94, you're going to hear some things. It's going to be right between the eyes. Uh, chapter 94. You guys ready for this? Everybody ready? Everybody seated, ready, ready to go? Because we're going to go through this. Personally, um, I know some things about the book of Enoch that maybe, well, not too many people know, especially um, the actual documents that were found. Well, they're not, they weren't documents at all. It's mind blowing. You know, when everybody gets into the kingdom and they see the truth, it's good that remorse won't be there because a lot of people are going to learn that number one, they were duped. And number two, those things that they thought were, you know, crazy were true. And those things they thought were sound were crazy. That's what they're going to find out. That's why I keep my mouth shut when, when it comes to things that, um, and when people are so sure about themselves, right? And they said, well, you know, um, like, for example, the book of Enoch, they said, no, the book of Enoch is not older than so-and-so. How can they ever say that? They're just trusting another person's knowledge. It's only a handful of people that ever touched the original scrolls in the first place. There are other copies, and they have been found all over the world, which is why a lot of people, these families who keep these um, archaeological finds, they know that there was international trade at the time, and that was a long time ago. That was uh, prior to the flood. They also know that society was a little more advanced than what we have now. That seems ludicrous. That's what they believe. They believe that because of the maps they found with it, because of some of the uh, some of the devices they found. And again, if if a flood or fire came, it's going to degrade all materials except stone. Stone is going to be the only thing left. Everything else is going to be absorbed back into the earth. There's one more element that'll be left, and those are crystals, right? So if you happen to see a crystal. But, but a crystal growth formation. And on the, on the inner layer of those crystals, you begin to see shapes like they were carved or something like that. Some very mechanical shapes. Then you're seeing some archaeological find. Crystals grow over, you know, it takes a long time for crystals to grow. All right? And so if you ever see that, because they used a crystal-based technology back then. They did. You can find out interesting properties about crystal right now. Crystal can hold voltage, right? Crystal can 
um, hold bytes of data or, or it can hold light data. It does that very well. It takes It's almost like a camera and it takes a snapshot of things and it will keep that image uh, forever so long as you don't expose it to extreme light again. In fact, that was a basis of photography. When they started messing with cameras, they were utilizing crystal. They were utilizing gunpowder crystal, and um, it's another element. But they were causing the image to be superimposed on the crystal. The crystal would 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 uh, capture the image and somehow organize the light in comparison to the light that was showing on it. They would then take that and reflect it onto different materials to see if they could extract or re-show that picture into some uh, materials that they could, uh, you know, capture on paper. So they had some ingenious techniques they used to use. Ingenious. It's kind of like your eyes. If you shut your eyes, the image of the last thing you saw is imprinted in your eyeball for maybe an hour. Maybe an hour. That includes a book. If you look at a whole page of a book, I'm telling you it's in your mind, and you can recall that entire page. Of course, that takes practice because your brain will begin to wire up differently to, to extract the image, the whole image, but you can do it. You can actually look at a page for less than a second, shut the book, and start reading that page from what you see. Not from memory, but from what you see. Because that image is going to be still processing in your eyeball. And it's recallable. Anyway, amazing things they had back then. But when it comes to the authenticity of the Book of Enoch, I've heard so many things. And I thank God that uh, the Lord has shown me specific things in my life. And when I hear people start saying what they say, it's almost like, oh, man, they just don't know. Because if they knew, they wouldn't say what they say. Right? Some of the conversations about these aliens I have big issues with. Right? Unless a person has walked side by side with one of these things or walked into one of these so-called craft, everything people are learning is from somebody else, some hearsay, something that people are making. Listen, if you hear something about something uh, esoteric and it makes sense to you, don't believe it. It's probably not true. Satan does a small trick I've learned in life right? because he duped me by plenty of times. If something, if a puzzle begins to come together and it makes sense in your mind, something is wrong with it. It's wrong with it, right? Something's not right. So when things appeal to your common sense as an explanation of the unseen, it's probably not real. Not real at all. Satan does this all the time. All the time. He'll wait, he'll take uh, subjects and He'll add some appeal to it and add some common things to it, make, raise that probability in your mind, and then you'll begin to accept something not real at all. He's appealing to your common sense, making it easy so you can believe, but keeping it fractured so it, you still have to dig to find it. Once you put effort in your research, you're not willing to let that research go because you, you have effort behind it. Then you'll begin to defend your own findings. And you'll do so vigorously, whether it be right or wrong. And because nobody can actually prove it wrong right now, right? Anybody can get away with anything they want to, make enough stuff, which is why we have a responsibility to make sure that the information we have is, is not coming from man, but is verified by the Holy Spirit in all of us. All of us. Not something interesting that makes sense, because normally when you have no confirmation inside, you need more evidence for something to make sense. Then when stuff starts coming together, you say, oh, that makes sense. Well, normally that's been wrong every single time. Everything that makes sense to, for example, a, a craft, listen to this, this might blow your mind, a UFO, right? Most people still think of them as craft. What if I were to tell you that in that other realm, in, in that encapsulating realm around this planet, they have a way of looking into this realm. And their way of looking in looks like a craft, and it indeed has physical interactions with things, which is why the craft can go into nothing. Right? It can just disappear. Not that it went fast. It can just vanish, which is why things can go right through walls. Think of it this way. If you were looking at a bird through your house window, Right? The bird is amazed to see you. It's amazed to see you because it does not have the concept of the window. It does not know it's a window. Right? 
it'll see a reflection of you, but it'll certainly see you. But when the sun is positioned in different ways to that bird, it looks like you have disappeared. But it's only a window to us. This is how we observe the outside world and the safety of our own homes. A window. A bird does not have that concept. They don't have that concept. So to them, it could be like, it's probably magic or something like that. Where'd that, per that person disappear? No, they didn't. They walked into the other room. Right? But because a bird does not have that concept, they have no reference to it. Right? Anything we don't have a reference to, we call it something else. We do. And what if I were to tell you that that, that veil is like a membrane, a biological membrane? An actual biological membrane that, that, that separates this realm from that realm. So it's alive, not computerized, not by technology, but an actual living biological membrane that blocks everything off, which is why some of the ships can fossilize. Because a ship would be what? A ship would be, if, if you could, if you didn't have to have a window, but every time you pressed your head to the wall, you could... The, the wall was thin where you could peek into the other realm, right? If you did that every time and indeed had the capability of pushing something out, where it would be encapsulated in a membrane, but now it looks like a 3D object to everybody else, that membrane is always going to be attached to, the, to whatever you send out there. So you're always going to be separated from the outside, right, by the membrane you just pushed through. Always. And if you have a crash or something like that, because you're trapped, because it comes in with dimensions, because the properties of one dimension cannot be housed or accommodated in another. You have to have a membrane to, to house it so that when the membrane is broken, right, then you can no longer see what's inside of it anymore. So long as the membrane's there, you can see it. As soon as it's gone, you can't. It's kind of like the way we peer into things. What about electronically and ultraviolet? Bugs see an ultraviolet light, but you don't, right? We don't see an ultraviolet. Bugs do. So they don't see flowers the way we do. Flowers look amazing to bugs. They look amazing. They have patterns on them, almost like eat here at Joe's. That's what the signs will say on a flower. That's what it looks like. Because flowers change their patterns every hour. You don't see that change. The bugs do. So there are different patterns on these flowers. That's how they know when something is ripe or not, because the patterns change. It indeed is quite beautiful. It's a whole different world out there when you start looking in ultraviolet. Whole different world. And bugs see in that spectrum. They can see in that spectrum. So things look a lot different. For example, animals look very different in UV. Animals have patterns on them. So do we. If we get fearful, patterns will pop up on your skin instantly in UV. If you had the optics to see an ultraviolet, you could see the patterns that pop up on human beings. We can observe it because we're not seeing the spectrum. But it most certainly happens. Right? Just like your saliva changes colors based upon your fear level. You have hormonal changes, therefore liquids that come out of your body are going to be based differently in, in uh, chemically. And they're going to have a different color to them, a different hue in that ultraviolet spectrum. So it's like the outside world can see many things about us and about nature that we can never see. Only electronically can we see those things, and it's quite beautiful, quite beautiful. But because you don't see it, you can never be amazed by it, though it can see you that way. Animals know things about you you don't even think they know because you're sitting there changing colors, patterns are popping up, Right, Your eyes will change their intensity uh, in UV based upon your hormonal levels and, and all these different things. So animals can pick up things, yes, by the nose, but by sight also. They can pick these uh, things up.